Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. We pray this message inspires you, builds your faith, and shows you how much God truly loves you. If you're ever in the Bartlesville area, we would love to meet you. For more information, visit our website at citychurchok.com. Let's jump into the message. We hope you enjoy. Good morning. Are you guys doing good today? It's a beautiful cloudy day outside. How could you not be feeling awesome? My name is uh, Mary Turner. My husband Scott and I are the co-lead pastors here at the church. And I am excited to start our brand new series, Uncensored, The Naked Truth About Relationships. Woo. All right. So I just want to start out by saying whatever relationship we talk about, because we're going to talk about a bunch of different kinds of relationships, it has principles for you that you can use. Like today we're going to talk about marriage. We're talking about lasting love. You can use that within any relationship to build it and to make it stronger. So I just want you to think about that. And I want us all to be really generous of spirit. You know, I want us to, to, to come into church not necessarily looking for what's in it for me, but what, what's in it for, for we, right? You may not really be excited about a marriage message today, but what about that cute couple next to you? Aren't you excited for them to be able to get these principles early on in their marriage? Again, like I say, there's going to be something in this for everybody. But we are talking about marriage today and all that that implies. So I want to give you a little content warning. Uh, for sixth grade on up, it is totally appropriate. If you have younger kids in here and you have not had certain discussions with them, I'm willing to do it for you here today. It's not going to get graphic or anything, but I want you to make that choice. So city kids might be the most age-appropriate place for them today, but that is certainly your choice. So we're going to talk a little bit about the naked truth about marriage. We're going to get a little uncensored in here. And then we're going to talk about what makes a marriage last. So I want to set a few ground rules for all the things that we're talking about today. First of all, there is grace. We are all at different places in our faith journey, and that is okay, right? If the, the devil tries to bring you condemnation during any point, that's not what we're looking for. Condemnation pushes you down and tells you how bad you are and what a worm you are. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit, and it gives you hope for the future. That's what's different today. And so there's grace, right? Also, another ground rule, past is the past. What happened before is not what we're talking about today. We are talking about the future. You may have been through a divorce. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Again, no condemnation. We are talking about the future. And third ground rule, if you want to ignore me, that's totally okay with me. I don't mind at all. We're talking about the Bible, so it's between you and God. So because we're talking about love today, we are going to go ahead and define love because there's lots of ideas about what love is about. So we're going to define it today. We're going to look at John 15:12. That says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. So he wants us to love each other the way he loves us. So how does he love us? Now, we can go throughout the Bible. There are lots of examples of how God loves us. I pulled three today that we're going to focus in on. First of all, God's love is sacrificial. If we look at John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son right? He gave. He sacrificed. That's how he shows us love, and that's how he asks us to show love to one another. Secondly, God's love is unconditional. Unconditional. John, uh, Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He didn't say, well, if you get cleaned up, well, if you meet these conditions, well, if you do that, then I'll send Jesus. No, he didn't do that at all unconditional is how his love is for us. And that's how he asks us to love other people. And then the third example of God's love is it is unstoppable. Unstoppable. Romans 8, 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, angels or demons, fears for today, worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. That's a lot of stuff. But he's saying, God's, my love is unstoppable. There's nothing that can stop my love for you, and that's how he wants us to love other people. So, sacrificial, unconditional, unstoppable. That's our definition of love today, the God kind of love that we're called to show other people. So, as I said, I'm speaking about marriage today, and Scott and I have been married for 26 years. It'll be 27 in April, and 24, 25 of those were really happy. So, that's the good news for us. Some of you will get that later. That's okay. But I think making it 26, almost 27 years is a pretty good example of lasting love. And I'm sure there are some of you who have a speech. So if you would raise your hands, if you've been married for more than 26 years, we want to be super impressed. Look at all these hands. We are filled. That's right. Congratulate them. 
We are filled with good examples of godly marriages. I mean, just turn to some of those people later and say, lay your hands on me. Tell me what it's all about, right? So we're going to delve into some things today that may make us a little bit uncomfortable, some things that we don't like to talk about because there is a lie that our enemy has told us in today's world that the Bible is old-fashioned and it's out of touch with the way we are living our life today when it comes to relationships. But with the divorce rate, the pornography consumption, just the dissatisfaction with relationships and the hookup culture and all that, I think it might be worth it to see what God has to say. Is there a better way? Is there a more satisfying way than what the world is serving up to us? So we are going to look at three different things. The naked truth about three lies being spread by the enemy in today's world. I gave you a content warning. Get ready. Here it comes. Okay, the first thing. The world says that sex is unrestricted. But the word says that sex has boundaries. Boundaries. Now, the Bible doesn't say that sex is, all right, is bad or shameful or something we need to avoid, that it's not important. No. If you think any of these things... I want to challenge you to read the Song of Solomon, right? It's a celebration of the physical, intimate side of marriage. It's something that God created, something he put boundaries in place, though, for our protection. It's not a casual physical interaction, right? Let's think about it in this way, thinking about it like saving money. So the two things that people love to talk about in church, sex and money, I've put into one example here. So this is going to be awesome. All right. So when you're saving money, you're doing it for a purpose, right? You want to go on a vacation, you want to buy a house, you want to send your kids to college, you want to buy a car, whatever. So you're saving money for a purpose. So you are laying aside temporary fun for the future gain. And that's what God is telling us about sex. He says, it's not that it's bad. It's not that I don't want you to do it. I'm saying if you can lay aside the temporary fun, the long-term gain of married, committed sex is worth the wait. Now, the world says that's completely old-fashioned. It's ridiculous. We can't live that way. Saving sex for a purpose, for those relationships with lasting value, that's just not the way we do it anymore. But you know what? That's not what God's word says. And I think it's, if that's what we're basing our lives on, we can't just pick and choose the areas we want to base our life on. Hebrews 13, 4 says, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Now, we like the scriptures that are like, you can do it and God loves you and yay. And we like those scriptures. But sometimes we need to go ahead and deal with the this, this scripture where it's like, Sin is sin, and this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to be really honest with you today. This is what God's word says. Sex is for marriage. It's not for outside of marriage. Why? Because it's a commitment that can end up hurting us instead of helping us, right? Adultery can lead to so much pain and destruction. Leading sex, casual sex can just lead to heartbreak. That's not what it was designed for. It was designed to bond us closer together. So when we use it improperly, it ends up hurting you. You know, we say don't touch the hot stove. It's not to prevent your freedom. It's to protect you. Okay, you guys like that one so much. I have another naked truth for you. It's called the world says lustful thoughts are no big deal. Oh, yes, I'm going there. The word says it's the same as cheating. Whoa, real quiet in this church. We may think that thoughts are just thoughts right? And I don't mean the fleeting, just something pops into your mind kind of thing, because the Bible says we're supposed to take our thoughts captive, which means God recognizes that thoughts can come into our head, but we get to choose what we think about, right? I'm talking about dwelling on it, lingering on the thought, thinking about someone that you're not married to, thinking about their body or having sex with them. That's what we're talking about. What does the Bible have to say about that? Matthew 5, starting in verse 27, You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Ladies, we're not off the hook. This is for us too because Jesus is upping the ante, right? He's saying the Christian life is held to a higher standard. We're not just going halfway here. We have to be all the way in, right? It's not just about, you know, looking good on the outside. (laughs) He's interested in our inner world as well. Are we willing to look at other people as just objects to be lusted after? Or can we see them as God's son or daughter deserving of respect? Would you want someone thinking about your child or your parent or your sibling in the way that you're thinking about that person? 
Because the truth is they are God's son or daughter. They are, they are created in his image. And so how we're treating them is really important. Jesus said it's not enough to be good where people can see. But like I said, God also sees our inner world because he knows that our thoughts lead to our actions. We don't just suddenly drop into a sexual relationship. It starts with our thought life, right? It's why we need that boundary. So third naked truth I'm going to share with you today. The world says divorce is an option, and the word says that divorce is not the plan. Now remember our ground rules. There's grace. We're talking about the future. We're not condemning anybody from the past because I am sure that everybody in this room has been affected by divorce one way or the other, whether your own or someone you love. My, my own parents got divorced when I was 14. It still affects me 30 plus years later, right? Divorce is, is not the plan. I can't lie to you and tell you it's all okay. It's not what God wants for you. And I would say in particular, those who have been divorced would say, absolutely, it's not great. But Matthew 19, 8 and 9, Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. And there are certainly reasons for divorce. And I had come, someone come up to me um, after church and mention that. And look, there, there are reasons, and I'm, I'm not saying there aren't, but we're talking about the rule and not the exceptions today. It's clear it's not what God had originally intended, which is what we're talking about. All that bonding and work and, and love and commitment was meant to last a lifetime, which says we need to take our relationships very seriously and not let it get to the point where divorce is even an option. Putting the principles of love in place so our hearts don't pull apart. So if we're willing to admit that maybe God has a plan, he's not trying to be some cosmic killjoy, he's trying to protect your heart, he's trying to protect your body, he's advising us to keep sex for a committed marriage relationship, to watch out for our thought life that it's important, and to take divorce off the table. You know, marriage takes work, it exposes our flaws, it exposes our selfishness, it exposes the ways that we aren't truly loving God and others the way we should, right? So how can we have a love that lasts a lifetime? We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 today, pull out some different scriptures that will tell us all about lasting love. And the first thing I want to talk about is how lasting love is patient. Lasting love is patient. Our favorite word, we love patience, right? Woo! We're such a microwave drive through why isn't my sandwich here two minutes after I ordered it kind of society, right? Ugh. But when you deal with people and there's people in a marriage, you need patience because we don't all move at the same pace. Marriage is all about give and take. Scott gives and I take. That's the way we do. No. It was a mom joke. It's not even a dad joke. It's a mom joke. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Ooh, that's a pretty high standard. But if you want to know how to make love last forever, we're going to have to have some pretty high standards. You know, Scott is so patient with me. I am mouthy. I said that to him yesterday. I, I don't always speak very kindly. I'm pretty sarcastic. I'm going to show my love to you by saying mean things to you, and sometimes I'm rude, right? All right. I'm sure some of you are too. Look at me all holy. But he forgives me. He makes allowance for my faults because he knows he has plenty of his own, right? That's why we need to have patience because we're probably going to need it in the next minute or so. Sometimes I'm charging ahead waiting for him to get on board and other times he's waiting on me. But patience means giving the other person space and allowing them to have their own feelings and their own choices and not ignoring them while we rush ahead. A love that lasts for many years is patient. It says in Ephesians 4, 2, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. So because of love, we make allowance. I love that, making allowance. Well, what was, what's the best possible reason that, that that could have been that way? Being willing to see it from someone else's perspective and not just our own. Giving grace and mercy, again, because we're probably going to need it ourselves, just like God does for us. Well, lasting love is not only patient, it is also peaceful. Oh, peaceful. We like peaceful. That's better. Leave patience in the dust. Let's talk about peace. When you looked out the window on Wednesday when it was snowing, wasn't it so peaceful? Outside was a beautiful blanket of snow and it coming down. And then all the kids came outside and they like ruined the snow and it was loud and noisy. But before that, it was beautiful and it was peaceful. Don't we all desire peace in our homes? Do you say that? Do you go to somebody's house and you're like, wow, your house is so 
peaceful. You know what? They've contended for that. They've fought for that. They've made that happen. It doesn't happen by accident. Do we really want to come home to arguments and bitterness and cold shoulders and, and sleeping on the couch? I don't think so, because the common denominator in relationships that stand the test of time is peace and acceptance. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 and 6, go back, sorry, to the other slide. It does not demand its own way, is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Not trying to get your own way. Isn't that awesome? It's not irritable. i be honest with you, anytime I am irritable or demanding my own way or keeping track of all the ways that Scott has disappointed me, I'm setting my marriage up for failure. Absolutely. Peace means you are not keeping score. Peace means you're controlling your emotions so it doesn't control the whole house. Yes, it was. You guys should write that down. Peace means you're not being selfish and you know what? It just feels good. It's much better than war. But you have to choose it. It doesn't just happen. Colossians 3.14, above, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. You know, when, when musicians play or, or singers sing and they're all in harmony, it sounds really good. Up here today, it sounded good. But if one instrument or one singer is off, Pastor Ryan, what happens? It sounds, it's bad. He said it's bad. It's terrible, right? It just, you don't know what it is, but something is off harmony in a marriage. We're working together for the same goal. We're not pulling against each other. That's peace. And that's, I think, what we all really want. But again, you have to fight for it. Patient, peaceful, and lasting love is protective. Protective. You need to have people in your life who look out for you. In a marriage, that needs to be your spouse. You know, we value our independence, but lasting love is protective. If I'm getting off track, if I'm doing something where I'm being unkind to people or I need a breath mint or whatever, I want Scott to tell me before somebody else tells me, right? Before I get myself in trouble and I'm hurting myself or others, I want him to protect me from myself sometimes, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, it love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Always. Not just when it's convenient, or when we think about it, or when we feel like it. Because you know what? We need to be our spouse's biggest fan and biggest protector. And I have done this myself, so I'm not pointing the finger out, but it really hurts me when I hear somebody kind of dragging down their spouse in front of others, right? It's okay for you to share your own embarrassing stories, but not your spouse's without their permission, right? It's just not cool. We need to protect one another. We need to make each other feel good in your presence and not bad. First Peter 4, 8 says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins, you know, if there's something going on, it's between Scott and me and God and none y'all. That's right. We keep it between us because, you know, you need to protect your spouse's privacy. Protect our spouse's reputation. Pray for one another. We speak the good and we share the best. That builds lasting love when you know you have someone in your corner who's looking out for you. Lasting love is patient. It is peaceful. It's protective. And it's also persevering persevering. It means to continue even in the face of difficulty, even during those hard times. It says there in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Again, that always word, not sometimes, not when we feel like always going through the hard times together. You know, all marriages have lows. I, I joked about it, but you know, we have not had great, all the times have been great between us. We have had difficult times, especially when we've neglected the relationship. It makes it easier to go into a low. But true commitment is when I say to him, hey, I'm willing to work this out. Even if I'm unhappy for a little while, oh my gosh, unhappy, we only want to be happy all the time. But I'm willing to be unhappy for a time while we work this out because I believe in the future happiness that it's going to bring. So it's really important. Sometimes it feels like we're in the, the bad side of the, the marriage vows, right? The sickness, the poor, the worst, right? We didn't get the richer, the, the, the healthy, all that good side. It just feels like, oh, oh we've got all the tough stuff. You know, maybe you, someone in your family is sick. One of your kids, one of you guys, you lost a job. It's just like hit after hit after hit. It's about persevering. It's about pulling together rather than pulling apart. That's how you're going to overcome, and that's how you're going to have lasting love. In Romans 12, 10, it says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 
devotion. That's not really a word that we talk about much anymore, about honoring someone else above yourself. Like, hey, I'm thinking about your needs before I'm thinking about my needs. I'm going to push forward through this difficult time with you because I believe that through our devotion to one another, through our love, we're going to come out stronger on the other side. Well, not only is love patient, peaceful, protective, persevering, lasting love is permanent. It is permanent. So we're going to hop back in slightly into the divorce. If you experience one, listen, understand, the past is the past. There is forgiveness. There's healing. There's a clean slate. All things can become new. But if you are currently in a marriage or you desire to be, you'll never have a successful relationship without throwing the option of divorce outside the, out the window. Honestly. And again, I'm not talking about the exceptions. I'm talking about the rule. Because if you're always thinking, well... Maybe I could, then you're never going to come together in that permanent way and have that lasting love. You know, I I, I joked in the first service, there's times where you hear on the news about someone who uh, just kind of ran away from their life. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. Maybe I'll just run away and live off the grid and get paid in cash and I'll just never come back. No, you can't think that way about life. That is not the solution. You can't have a backup plan to this an exit strategy. You got to be all in or it's not called commitment. In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, it says prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. You know, everything else is going to pass away, but love lasts forever. Why? Because God is love. And that's why it's so important to him that we have permanence in our love relationships. You know, we treat him and we adore him and we love him. We need to do the same for those around us. Psalms 89, 1 through 2. I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. Are we willing for our love not to fail but to last forever? Are we willing to be faithful and endure? Are we willing to do these things? Well, if you are, you're going to have a successful marriage because that's a lot of it, right? Just being willing to show up every day and put the hard work in. Because love is a choice that we make every day. Do we choose patience or do we choose frustration? Do we choose peace or do we choose war? Do we choose protection or do we uh, choose exposure? Do we choose perseverance or do we just give up? Do we choose permanent love or temporary. It's a choice that we make every day because those little choices lead to big decisions. But I want to tell you today, I want to encourage you, there is no relationship that is too far gone for God. He can bring healing to anything. He can raise the dead. I think he can raise your marriage up from wherever it is today, but you have to be willing to put in the work. Are you willing to try again? Are you willing to go to counseling until you find the right counselor? Are you willing to put aside your own desires for a time to do what's best for the relationship? Are we willing to make the choice to love our spouse like God loves us? What do we say? Sacrificially, unconditionally, unstoppably. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm making it a word. But the basis for any relationship, we need to bring this back, is our relationship with Christ. 100%. Being loved gives you the capacity to love. So if you have never solidified your relationship with the Savior, today is the day to do it because it's really hard to put all these other principles in place unless you have the first thing in place. It says in 1 John 4, 19, we love each other because he loved us first. So in other words, we can only love each other if we understand that he loved us first. We gotta get that relationship solid and in place. And how did he love us? He loved us sacrificially. He gave his life for us. He came and he lived his life perfectly, and yet he still offered himself as a sacrifice on the cross for our sin. He did that for us. He did it without condition, and no one could stop him from his mission because he loves you that much. So if you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment. If you have never made a commitment to Christ He's already made a commitment to you. All he's asking today is, would you pray a prayer and commit your life to me as well, God says, so that we can get started on this journey of faith, this this love walk towards God that extends to all the other people in your life. 
Would you just pray with me today to commit your heart to him and allow him to bring change to your life? With nobody looking around, everybody's eyes are closed, if you would just slip up your hand so I know who I'm praying with today. We're not going to point anyone out. We're not going to make you uncomfortable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I see you in the back. These are important, life-altering decisions that we're talking about today. I'll give you just another second. Okay, we're all going to pray together because I don't want anyone to feel left out. But if you raise your hands, I want you to make these words your words. I want you to get them deep into your heart and understand how much God loves you. Let's pray together. Jesus, I believe you died for me. You spilled your blood on the cross as a sacrifice for my sin. And you're preparing a place for me in heaven, my eternal home. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for accepting me, for teaching me how to love. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate with those that raise their hands today. Thanks again for joining us. We love the small part we get to play in helping you on your journey with God. Email us at info at citychurchok.com if there's anything that we can do to help you with the next step. Also, if you've enjoyed the message, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Have a great day. Join us again next week.